Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here. And I'm playing Hearts of Iron 4 with World of Blaze mod as Italy. And but before we get into that, if you like, you could please subscribe to the channel, um, like the videos, comment below, all that helps so much. It looks like they've got that province held, so we're going to come up to here. And we just got this. Okay, so now, well, whether this is the, well, this would be the pocket. Well, I guess this is the pocket because they've moved their capital out to Barcelona. Okay, so we've now pocketed a huge amount. We really don't want to cross the, attack across the river, that is. Issue general contracts. Okay, where's the other, where's the other division? Okay, so Okay, 14 days I'm just sort of kind of waiting to get to 39 to do some of these. Because I'd rather have some of the stuff going before just building some forts that I don't need right now. Because I have... Um, is there any reason to wait on taking Albania? I don't know that they have any industry or are pursuing any aviation effort too. Oh, really, that's what they should be doing. Again, I hate... <sighs> I so hate this stuff. Okay. What they did. And this, this I'm talking about uh, Hearts of Iron, not about the mod. Um... Yeah, um, 28 days, things are so you know we're not going to pur pursue that at the moment. Let's just grab up. Yeah, I don't know that we're going to get any mu any real economic benefit there, but whatever. Um, yeah, I do sort of want radar stations. I like that. Okay, we're going to not concentrate our effort, but we're going to attack those two provinces simultaneously and hoping. Well, and we'll support that attack from there. We don't want them breaking out, but. We will hit them everywhere. Oh, where did the German go? He was just standing around looking pretty. Oh, there he is. He's marching around looking pretty now. Okay. Bordello bum bum. Okay. Is that some sort of saying about Bagdaglio? I don't know. here with you guys. Oh, well. Okay, you divisions are going to head back this way. You can cut Spain in two here. Yeah. I don't know if attacking through these mountains are a good idea, but we'll try it nonetheless.
Okay, new fighter. More mm, closer support wall, actually, but yeah. to them fairly quickly. You attack there just to stop these guys from moving in. They're pursuing these guys before they get organized. Now we're waiting for our tanks to move into the hills, which is, or the mountains, which is probably the main delay. Okay, um, well. Yeah, the MC-200, that's a good plane, and we definitely will pursue it, but I didn't want to pursue it early. We can wait till next, well, later in the year, if not next year. Albanian occupation. Let's see what happens with that. Does that give me an event here? Okay. Or a decision or something? Maybe. Or do I just need to wait? Maybe just need to wait. Um... Nope, we want to annex it. There we go. Okay, well, let's see. Oh, good. Well, we got three dockyards. Okay, nothing down there in the south, but three dockyards, six sieve factories, and two mill factories. Very nice. Probably a bit, especially the dockyards, a bit overly much. And I blame the game, not the mod for that. Now, um, I don't know about doing some of those. Let's see if we were to stick a, well, we can, we're, okay, war's going to happen later, so we don't need to do, I mean, knowing what's going on in the Mediterranean right now is fun, but not overly useful. So, let's build factories now that will help us today, not just someday. And also part of the, my thoughts here, air research doctrines, yeah, that would help, okay, that'll help, ooh. Okay, do I just for a thousand days? Don't know why just for a thousand days, but okay. 35 days, we'll do that. Okay, well, now that they move to there, you come to here. Zog submits. We're going to come to here with you, and you're going to march to there. If you attack up to there, what you're supposed to do is stop them from attacking here. Okay, well, 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 okay, stop attacking there. Start attacking there. We want to capture these units, not push them out. Cut off these units. Anarchist uprising. Well, like they've already lost their territory for the anarchist uprising. Ah, more military factories. Okay, well. Oh, yeah, let's do this. No, well, let's look for a moment of research. Let's just find the. 
Okay, well... You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to produce any of these better um, planes. I'm just going to keep producing what I have and then make the jump to there once we do so. Sometimes the ju big jump is really difficult for it, but I think we'll just continue to spam these out. Um, just more numbers over quality. Like too many of their units are getting out, at least more than I wanted them to get out. Let's pound into Valencia while we can. Oh, where's my other infantry division over here? Okay, well, that's good. You come down this way now. Okay, well, we ended up with just, what, one division in the pocket, but still, okay. Oh, that one's retreating back into the pocket, nice. Okay. Go. Go. You come along the coast. Pronto, signore. Okay, you attack there, you come to here. This is empty. Well, you know, let's let's retask you to drive around that way. Because he's gonna attack there like that, and then he's gonna support that attack. Yeah, I know it's fortified, but I'm hoping we can still push it and do it before they get too strong. That's a weak shell of a division, and so is that. Okay, they're coming out. Let's push into here. Cut these guys off even more. push on them. Not necessarily. So I've read that in North Africa during the campaign, it was who had the most aircraft up in the, the day that was ruling the skies. And now, or maybe you're just talking in the game, that's a different matter. Pasta makers are good specialists, special units. Yeah, they can be. Um, you definitely want the Italians to be your cooks and not the Germans, that's for sure. Um, unless you really like um, knock horse. Um, they really found that because it was sort of a big open area, because there really wasn't huge numbers of aircraft anyways, it was he who could put the most aircraft up in the sky, did the best air, air that day. Now, of course, if you had some Spitfires or Hurricanes, zip, being able to locate and find, because they, this wasn't a you know, high-density radar zone like you have over the battle, you know, over Britain. Um, if you can locate and find crappy Italian aircraft, 
the hurricanes and spitfires would now italians did have some some good oh in game okay um italians did have some good fighters but um and yes i am uh, quantity over quantity over quality well i'm going obviously the opposite route now but um and so if they could locate you know that they would shoot the, the the crappy Italian stuff out of the sky. But there was often cases that those crappy Italian airplanes that got up into the sky and flew that day, because sometimes the Spitfires were needing too much maintenance, they couldn't fly that day. The Italian fighters would get up there and strafe, because everything's sort of fairly exposed out here, strafe ground units, where you might not be able to strafe those ground units effectively in the forests and even in the plains, because, you know, yeah, it's sort of hills, but there's trees and houses and whatnot to hide around. Not really out here. So, yeah, quality is a quantity all of its own. But, yeah, I hear you in the game. It was the best biplane they had. Yeah. Um... I don't know much about Arno about the Italian aircraft models. Biplanes are, generally speaking, very good at um, maneuvering. It's just that they're slow. And so if you can zoom and boom, you know, zip by them really fast and, and shoot them and then pull away, it doesn't. And if you can do that before they can react and before they can, um, you know, dodge or whatever you can kill them but um if they can dodge or get out of the way the maneuverable aircraft can be better of a biplane mm. let me just well 120 days yeah let's do this we'll get this going and then we'll jump to the better f fighters. For that, and I guess we'll put up more fighters now. Now we have another slot. Let's. How are we doing a motorized? So we need a lot more support equipment. We never caught up. We caught up a motorized. Okay. So let's let's do more support equipment. We'll do two more factories at least once we get the more. We can cut off this last port one way or another. We've got all these guys off. We can get to destroy them. And they'll be easy to kill because they won't have any organization or equipment. Yeah, we'll do this. I don't know of any other doomy, looming countdowns that I got to sort of get to right now. Cut off from if you had any, but if you even if you didn't have any, you're, you were already but cut off from supplies. Si, 
Oh, we've got to improve. Is there any of these guys that we can actually improve? No. Um, none of these other generals have been active enough to get... Oh, well. What could we do? Okay, well. Let's see. Unyielding defender. Defense, okay. He already has that. Organization, first reinforcement rate, recovery rate. Let's go, let's go that. Let's try and use up some of my command power. Unuseful things. Okay, we've learned some lessons from the Spanish Civil War. Okay, Spanish State Alliance, demand the Balearics. Mm. If infrastructure will definitely help. Yeah, let's let's do this. Let's look over here. I think maybe we should now try this. There we go. We pursue. Rush, rush, rush. Don't give them a moment's break. It must have been really, really different. I'm just thinking about how would I feel if I was driving around in one of these little tanks? And I thought, you know, in the Spanish Civil War or something like that, pretty okay. Because, you know, they got two machine guns on there. You know, you're, whether you're driving or your buddy is driving and you're using the machine guns, it's okay. And then I... You can get refineries. Okay, we'll see about that. Um, uh, but then I thought about the um, Germans that occupied Italy. That you know, in the occupation, they acquired a bunch of these light tanks, and they used those tanks. And how would I feel as a German? Now, some of them are organization tote guys, and if you don't know, organization tote is a sort of a construction organization, basically, but they have armed units partially to guard um, involuntary labor, we'll call it. Um, but they also recruited labor, you know. 
sign up here, pay, because a lot of people, because you know, even if you have a ration book, doesn't mean you get food, it just means you have the ability to buy food. Get pay and better ration book. Sign up here, join organization tote. You know, so both voluntary and involuntary labor, but they also had guards and security units. And they were worried about partisans and whatnot in Italy, so that's mainly who the organization tote was armed and equipped to fight, not like the Americans. So, yeah, they weren't really thinking of driving the little L3s or CV-33s or whatever you want to call them against American Sherman tanks. But, yeah, getting that late in the war, I'm sort of like, yeah, I'm in a little metal box that anything but a rifle can penetrate me. I may not want to stay in here when things start getting shot around. So, yeah. Depends on what time of the war it is, whether I would want to be in a CV-33 or something similar. Just running around out here as the machine gun bullets are flying and the mortar shells and the light artillery going off. It might be sort of nice to be in a, in a even lightly armored box. It'd be hot. It'd, uh, you know, have engine fumes probably coming into it. of lighting light, light warfare came after the after the what Polish Russia war I'm not exactly sure you're, you're talking about 1920 yeah because tanks in World War one weren't well they, they had the, the British had the whip it tank just a big machine gun only armed and fast tank. That was trying to be, you know, um, you know, motorized armored cavalry type stuff. It was trying to be that. I'm not saying that it succeeded, but that was sort of what it was trying to do. Um, oh, and yeah, like if you ever redo your. Um, Italian, the Caproni N1 shouldn't be in 45. It should be like, what, 1938 or 37? The Italians can have jet fighters. Now they should suck, but you should be able to have them early. If you want jets, Italy can have jets early if they want them. They had them, they were early. They just sucked. Uh, not really. I don't know, I did sort of skip, okay. Where are the off the tank? Yeah, I'm not so much worried about artillery recovery, maybe so much as more soft attack. So I guess we'll do this. Um, yeah, we'll spend the bonus. Now, I will object to your idea of the science of lightning warfare. Um, I believe in the term art, uh, the art of war, not a science. It is not scientific. I have a degree in political science. I don't think political science exists. So I have a, I have a university degree in a subject that I don't believe exists. Politics is not a science. You don't put in f formula X and get Y results every time. Politics is an art form. It is not a science. It is not a, like a social, it isn't even a social science. Now I know social, social departments sort of feel like, yeah, we want to have, you know, oh, we'll change this to the newer stuff. We want to have a scientific term like the other departments. Eh, no, um, it should be, you know, the art of politics. Some, some sociology, yeah, does sort of get to social science, but politics is an art. It isn't a, it isn't a science. Warfare is not an art. I mean, it is, it is an art. It is not a science. Too much of warfare. Yep. We're going to put these two factories into building naval bombers. Because I want naval bombers. You know, um, is in the too, too much of warfare happens in inside the minds of men. Often the, the unit commanders, whether it's a platoon or a theater commander, and it's not how many... 
tanks you have on the battlefield and how well they're organized. It's how... Um, well... You know, it's surprise. But surprise doesn't mean collapse. It, the enemy commander can be dogged and dig in and turn that surprise attack around and just defeat the enemy because surprise attack may be one quarter of your strength, but at night time or in fog or whatever, you don't know that they're only one quarter of you and all you know is you're being shot at by machine guns and they're over there and you don't want to be where you are so you want to leave, but maybe your commander keeps you there, keeps you shooting back. And even though the enemy's in a better position and did the surprise, you still win because the mind of your commander was enough that was able to communicate to your troops to hold out. That's why science and military and science and politics terms I disagree with. Okay, well, um... Okay, I guess we'll do that. <coughs> Napoleonic tactics. Yeah, well, now Napoleonic tactics, in my opinion, in my viewpoint, is really the start of combined warfare tactics. Because it was sort of Napoleon that's starting to create... Um, Persistent, not necessarily permanent, but persistent divisions. Where, and you see this up until, even in a way, modern day, but like in England, in which I know the army the best as it progresses over the ages, in the, in the 18th century and in through to the Napoleonic era, you have the Royal Artillery, which also sort of c controls the Royal Engineers. And they hardly even talked to the army. Now they're part of the army, but they even hardly talk to the army. Meaning they can go years, literally years, with maybe literally hardly. I mean, I'm not saying if they don't, they don't like say say hi to each other in the street, but they don't talk to each other. And it's sort of like in the in the Royal Artillery, you get your officers' commission based on capabilities. You know, you go through schools, you get trained. You know, in mathematics because you know do mathematics to shoot artillery at people and do the engineers, and you go through the. Where in the army, you're sort of like, oh hey, I want to be a captain. No, I haven't even been a lieutenant. Haven't even you know been anything. Haven't had any training. I want to be a captain. Hey, I have money. Give me a commission. And okay, sure. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're you're the son of that dude, and you have money. Okay, we'll give you a commission. Now, of course, you're supposed to start learning your trade, but you bought into a captaincy. Now, some people, if you're buying right into a uh, a colonelcy, you're just it's just for flavor. You don't really actually command it. But in captains or whatever, yeah, you know, and they it was really abusive. Now, generals were promoted up differently, but they're they're a different thing. But you know, majors, captains. You're supposed to step through it, but you can sort of, without too abusive, jump past, you know, first and second lieutenants, if you will, jump right into a captaincy if you had the money. And, you know, you sort of bought it up there. And so the artillery and the army weren't talking to each other. And then, oh, we're playing war with France again? Yeah, we do it out every 20 or 30 years. Okay, fine. And so, oh... Hey, yeah, General so-and-so, yeah, we have this new artillery piece we developed five years ago. It does this other thing. What? You have a what? I've never heard of that. I mean, it was literally almost that kind of thing. Uh, I'm overstating it for dramatic effect. Hey, Ragar, how you doing? And so, yeah, I'm overstating it a bit for dramatic effect, but it really is a separate, the Royal Artillery and the rest of the army are separate institutions. One is sort of scientific and performance-based, the Royal Artillery and the Engineers. They're sort of associated with each other. And the, the Army. And if you ever watch any, if you haven't watched Zulu, wonderful movie, go watch it. It's great. And there's two officers commanding, Shard and Bromhead. Forget, I think it's Bromhead. He, he is an engineering officer who is 
one, tasked with building a bridge over a river, and he sort of kind of finds some troops laying about and starts telling them what to do, and they sort of like, well, okay, there's an officer guy, he's wearing the proper coat, but he's telling us what to do. And when their, their lieutenant shows up, who's been off hunting in, in, in Africa, this is, of course, during the, you know, the Zulu Wars in 1880 or whatever, um, you know, shows up and, you know, speaking, you know, played by Michael Caine, speaking in a very, you know, high-class British accent, you know, well, yeah, but it's sort of nice that you would ask before you just use my troops. You know, not that he was going to complain or the guy didn't have the right authority to use the, the company that was sort of guarding the ford because it was like a ford to get across the river there. And there's a little mission that, that they're there, but it was to build a bridge to, to move supplies up easier. You should have asked first, you know, so sit around for a day or a week until I come back from my little hunting trip and just wait for it. But okay, yeah, go ahead and and do that. You, they can continue working on your bridge. And and so he sort of, conf the, the, the lieutenant sort of confirmed to the sergeant, yeah, you should follow this, this engineering officer's orders because he's an engineer. And then, uh-oh, you know, the, the sort of fleeing cavalry come by and tell him, yeah, we're fucked at Isal and Dewanda. Think everyone got ass fucked. They're coming to ask, fuck you soon, you better run. And so the, the infantry officer, who's a presumably a pretty good officer, you know, wants to get out and deploy his troops and, you know, skirmish fight and retreat and whatnot. And, and yeah, he's going to do this. And the other guys, well, yeah, no, we should defend this little fortification building here. Ah, well, we're both lieutenants. Well, and so what they do is they compare their dates of commission. And this is what it was. The guy in charge... It's the guy who's been a lieutenant the longest. And it turns out, I don't know, by a day, a month, a year, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The engineering officer has been a, been a lieutenant longer than the infantry officer. So the, so, the, so the the engineering officer is in charge. Now this, I don't know if it comes across in the movie well, but this panics, in essence, the... Um, the infantry officer, because the guy that's now in charge, to in his thinking, in his mind, in the in the professional soldier's mind, and he's presumably you know by this point, by the eighteen eighties, there you still bought your commission, but you you had to go through training, and you're you're, you're you, they've gotten rid of most of the really bad ones, um, you know, and you know even if you go through training, you can still really have bad officers, but he's panicked that here's this guy who has presumably. No training in combat because you could be a Royal Engineers officer and never gone through a day of like, oh, that bullet comes out of that end of the gun. Okay, how interesting. Because he's been trained to build bridges and build fortifications. Obviously, he knows which way the bullet comes out of the gun, but he's not ever been trained in any sort of battlefield leadership skills necessarily. I'm not saying whether he had or hadn't had any experience. Um, Bromhead, I believe it's Bromhead of the two. Um, I don't think he did, you know, and whatever. But, okay, he's now in charge. So this this professional soldier is now seeing a non-professional soldier, who's a professional engineer, is now in charge of his command. And if he were to go, fuck you, I'm taking my, platoon, my, my company out of here, and the other guy makes it out alive, uh, he's ruined his career, he's ruined his life. And it's probably better to die and let all your troops die than to ruin your life. That's sort of the thinking of the British soldiers, at the, the officers at the time. So yeah, oh fuck. I've just now been saddled with an idiot who's going to, to, to run my command. Because this guy has no training. We barely talk to these engineer guys. We just sort of tolerate them because we need them to build a bridge across this stream or do this other thing. And yeah, they know, yeah, building a bridge, building a building. Hey, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a fool. I don't want my house built by somebody who's not a, you know, a, a construction engineer. You know, so, you know, it doesn't think the guy's stupid. just thinks the guy has no idea what he's doing. Now, of course, had you followed shards, Tactical. Well, if they had been able to tactically retreat and get out there, I don't know if they would have. If the Zulus would have pursued them past the mission, I don't know. They very well might have. They probably would have been fucked because there were just way too many um, Zulus. 
And at least one MP showed up, which was, you know, a few thousand men, and they just got, you know, like 100 guys or 80 guys or whatever. They're, you know, outnumbered 10 to, or 20 to 1, literally. They would have been screwed. And and the cavalry, uh, which is uh, local South Africans who also hate the Zulus, that are sort of a volunteer force, they say, fuck you and run away. Uh, they just they just split. And the local black levies, which weren't, if you, it wasn't like, Let's say Imperial Black Levies over you now these were black sort of construction workers, semi military types. They hated the Zulus too, because the Zulus were big mean tribes that beat up on the other tribes around them. So the other black um, groups like, yeah, you're going to protect us from the Zulus. We like you. Um, you. Trust me, there was a lot of black Africans, particularly in South Africa, where the Afrikaans, the, the guys, there, they did have slavery. They weren't the slaves like sending off to America or whatever, but they did sort of have local slavery a bit. Um, but not huge plantations, my understanding, in, in the early days. But even there, obviously the slaves could run away, but um, there were these big evil Zulus out there, and so the guys with the white guys with the guns were sort of cool to hang around with because the black guys with the spears were actually worse than the white guys with the guns. So, yeah, not all of the, you know, um, black people disliked imperialism they especially when you got to up into Rhodesia um, it was a different tr um, different tribe that was sort of um, big and mean to everyone that the whites came in and yeah stop being mean to these other people really I mean to the point that people weren't able to live in villages they had to live out hiding in the bush because if they sort of formed a village they'd come and get raided um, and the a few whites showed up and said, yeah, stop that. Bang, bang, bang. Shoot, shoot the bad ones. And the other ones were like, oh, you're going to shoot these bad people? And, oh, you're just going to take some of that, that nice, juicy farmland that, well, it was sort of my grandfather's, but now these black guys were killing me every time they saw me. You're just going to take most of the nice farmland, and but leave me alone and protect me from the guys that are killing me? Well, okay. I mean, that's really how a lot of the colonialization happened, is that, you know, the white guys, they might not be wonderful for the black people, but they were less bad than the, the, the mean bullies that were already there. And so, yeah, you know, that's why few white people with guns and had a good reputation were generally able to rule large numbers of black people because, yeah, they're not perfect, but they're sort of better than the the, the bad bullies, and they, they, they keep the bad bullies down. And so, yeah, they're racist, they're whatever, but they're not so terrible, and especially the English showing up sort of stopping the slavery of the Afrikaners um, eventually. Still allowing to sort of racial segregation and all, but stopping slavery. And so, yeah, the, the, the black sort of levy troops, they all desert and split out. But the, the proper English troops obey orders and fight. And they, he, um, Bromhead does a brilliant, sets up defensive, use, use the food bags for the troops that were meant to be coming across the river as sandbags and fight off the Zulus, fight off an incredible number of them, and wins because he understands siege warfare and he understands. But the army doesn't, the, the standard army officer doesn't not really know that engineering officers understand siege warfare because they're trained to take forts and or build and defend forts and how to do that. They're not good officers necessarily. I mean, it doesn't mean that they don't know what happens on a big battlefield, but they're not trained to do, you know, open battlefield warfare. They're trained to do siege warfare, but they literally don't hardly talk, especially at like lieutenant's levels. I mean, you know, the guy who's in charge of, you know, you know, um, a major or a colonel of engineers does talk to the brigadier general or whatever, and they sort of know the stuff. But down lower level, they hardly talk to each other. They don't eat together. They hardly nod an acquaintance to each other. And that's how the British, I know we're talking about um, the stuff, that's how the British army, and that, that was in the 1880s. Okay, well, the Napoleonic, so you have this Napoleonic warfare. Napoleon is the one that's first really going, okay, you're a divisional commander now, Ney or... Um, whoever, Marshal Ney, well, he's obviously Marshal higher than, higher than a divisional commander, but you're now a divisional commander, and you'll have some, these infantry battalions under your control, 
and you'll have these batteries. Now these artillery batteries, they're going to do what you say. If there's another artillery officer, he can't come along and say, oh, well, we're going to use those artillery for this other thing. No, no. These are permanently signed to your division until I or whoever we unassigns them. So you actually now have some artillery that's part of your division. Oh, and see these squadrons of cavalry? They're assigned to your division, not some cavalry officers can pull them away. The, you know, higher ranking or some other. No, these, the cavalry, now cavalry in Britain has been part of the army, but they're a separate part of the army a bit more. You, you, you don't, your officers don't, you don't, you know, 99% of the time or whatever, a cavalry officer doesn't exchange commission for an infantry unit. Um, it's sort of their own hierarchy. But um, and but they do talk to, they do talk to the, the infantry and the cavalry do talk to each other in the British Army. Um, you know, they're, they're more, more, more together than the artillery than, and the engineers are separate. But, um, but now with Napoleon, you're sort of permanently, permanently is a bit overstating it too, but you're now permanently assigning a number of cavalry units to this group of infantry battalions that you're organizing in brigades that are forming a division. And now with Napoleonic warfare of Napoleon, you're starting to get the idea of an organized combined armed situation. It may not be anything like we're seeing in World War II, especially obviously there's no motorization, there's no armor. Um, armor does exist in the past, but it's, you know, armored battle wagons that were sort of moved around and then part. So those sort of semi-mobile fortresses, you see this often in um, the East, different kinds of things that whether with horses or oxen would move these wagons around that they then sort of form up together and guys would be archers you know, shooting their crossbows or whatever out of these battle wagons that are sort of semi-fortress like things so yeah there is a, a vague concept and of course um, Leonardo da Vinci draws some ideas of tanks in the you know the Renaissance so there is an idea of mobile armor but eh, mostly it's not really a workable thing so, but yeah, so the Napoleonic era is when we start to see the idea of combining the arms under a coordinated commander and not just he who commands the battlefield because you find, you know, go back to Ramillies or some of the other stuff in the early 18th century. Yeah, the general in charge, you know, the general, because he's no longer a, because this is, this is the idea of what a general is. He is no longer a cavalry, I mean, he may be coming out of the cavalry there for true, but he's no longer an infantry officer or a cavalry officer or a colonel or a major or anything like that. He is now a general officer. Now, this is the, the term. He has now made it to a level of command that he is a general officer. And so you may have, back in London, 20 generals. Hey, yeah, general, what's your name? You're going to go command these 20 battalions, 10 batteries, 30 squadrons, and go and do this stuff. This other general, you know, and you just vaguely give out sizes of forces. Now, sometimes you have sub-generals and whatnot, and that control parts of them because it gets too big for one general to sort of control on the battlefield. But these general officers are just sort of, but yeah, next week, next month, you may be commanding a completely different collection. Which, well, there may be two or three battalions, batteries, or whatever in this new collection of units, but it's going to constantly flow and change, and it's not really, um, unless it's sort of isolated, you know, because sometimes you get isolated campaigns, um, it's not really a any sort of permanent organ organized um, combined arm stuff. And so, yeah, the general officer may be seeing, now's the moment for the cavalrys to charge. So he sends one of his orderlies, they all ride horses, riding over to the cavalry. Yeah, charge over there. Sort of vague instructions, you know, charge at that hill or whatever. Oh, okay. So we get ready and they go charge. Now, no one's necessarily told the infantry officers that the cavalry is going to be charging. It's not a proper, I mean, there's an idea of it, but it's not really a proper combined arms warfare. And it's really starting in the Napoleonic era that you're getting, with Napoleon more so, Wellington's coming along with the theories too and, and starting to form divisions that are somewhat permanent of units. And not just, uh, now see with Wellington, you're you're finding more the idea of of brigades and then brigades forming divisions of infantry 
that are sort of permanent, but they're not so much assigning cavalry or artillery that's permanent to the division. It's more of a division of infantry that you're at least most of the time finding um, with it. Now, in a de facto sense, because General what's his name, it doesn't matter whether it's Bradford or whatever, but um, maybe sort of running up along the coast on his own for weeks or months at a time, and yeah, he only has the cavalry and the artillery with him, so it stays with him for a long time. But when there's three or four brigades, one week a battery may be supporting one brigade, you know, three or four brigades together, uh, and the next week it's um, supporting a different brigade, and you know, and then the general decides to move all of his cavalry over to the to the left wing or something. So, so the the cavalry that was sort of working with another brigade, well, it's just gone now because it's just over, um, you know, the, over all concentrated somewhere else. So it's much more fluid as opposed to a cavalry division, which Napoleon's army did did have some, or divisions that had attached cavalry that least in the normal course of warfare, don't get pulled away. So it's sort of the Napoleonic era that we're starting to see a combined arms idea coming out. I know I've sort of gone into a bit of a thing. Hussite battle wagons, yes. Oh, yeah, I mean, they go back. The idea of battle wagons um, goes way back into, um, you know, ancient Egypt, uh, the pre-sea peoples, whoever the hell they were. I don't think we have a good idea for sure yet who the sea peoples were that came in. Um, sort of was some of the first big collapse of society um, in really ancient antiquity. Yeah, no, they, 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 you know, you go way back to the idea of a wagon that is maybe just with wood and hide on it. Um, hide doesn't burn so well. So, you know, if you're just shooting simple fire arrows at, at a hide-covered wagon, you're, you probably put the, the fire out if it's that. So, yeah, battle wagons, you know, go back to to ancient times. So there's armor, mobile to a degree, I meaning it's not necessarily rampaging across the, the battlefield, but it's moving to a good position, maybe pull away the whatever is moving. It could be humans, but more likely animals of some sort. And then if the battlefield changes enough, they might reattach the you know, the animals and move it to another location and then withdraw it. That's sort of the normal way. And then, of course, there's various siege type Oh, 14th century, what, um, we do not, um, response to solution. Sumeria did it first, I think, 14th century. Yeah, and so, you know, it goes all the way back there. So armor and warfare, and then, of course, you have siege towers, you know, some of the, uh, Heli, what is it, um, Heli, not Heliopolis, he, uh, Something heliodestructive that they built to, you know, attack the city walls somewhere. Yeah, you know, that's sort of a, a siege thing, not so much an open battle thing. But yeah, you know, so armor does exist. And of course, you do have the individual armor uh, eventually of the knight. Sort of the cataphract too, but maybe not quite as heavily armored. Um, so yeah, you know, you have these sort of ideas. And now the knight sometimes is fighting on foot, so and sometimes on the horse. So it's not necessarily... And the knight when it becomes a knight, is no longer a scouting force. It is a um, battlefield impact force. And it is um, to a point, and this is what one guy who, um, I think back in the 90s, decided to ride his horse, like somewhere up in Europe, out, this was when it was still sort of politically and environmentally, meaning there wasn't so much terrorism, uh, able to, he was going to ride, he and his wife or whatever were going to ride horses um, to the um, Middle Ages to sort of reenact, um, you know, a knight traveling through the Crusades. Well, he found after a few days of riding his war horse, a big, you know, sort of war horse-like horse, couldn't ride it anymore because it was just too hard to ride, the clop, clop, clop of this big horse. So what he did is he bought a smaller riding horse, and they just turned his war horse into a pack horse because it could carry a lot of weight. And that's what, if you look into it, a lot of knights had two horses, one to ride around all the time in, and the other to go in and, you know, train and do battle training and then go and do battle on with all his armor on it. So when get ready to go fighting, so knights weren't a scouting force. They were sort of heavily armored impact forces on the battlefield that um, 
starting with crossbow, well, starting a little bit with longbows, um, because you see Cressy and Agicor and whatnot, but um, really being, but that was sort of specialized to only England being able to have longbows. Really the sort of spreading of crossbows and definitely was the gunpowder that, you know, finally doomed, you know, muskets, finally doomed the idea of, of heavy armored individuals that fulfill the sort of tank role in the battlefield. So cavalry becomes scouting and pursuit, you know, after the battle and maybe still impact, but only at critical moments once the enemy is weak. And World War I armor is your favorite. Now, are you talking personal body armor or tanks? Not quite sure. Knights were more like airplanes locked behind logistics and needed to operate from a safe area. To, to a degree, yeah, I will give you that, in that they needed the logistics. They needed a safe area to um, get ready to fight, you know, put all that armor on. Even in the chainmail days, you know, when it did just chainmail and it had a heavy helmet and a shield, they were still sort of knights and not yet the, you know, fully kitted out, plated armor knight kind of thing. But, um, yeah, and so so that disappears really effectively. I mean, you still have the cuirassiers trying to be it, but it's not really that effective. It is extremely rare you find well ordered infantry that a direct attack the cavalry can can break. Now, if they can attack them on their flanks or their rear, they're not well ordered in the sense they weren't didn't have time to form a square or some sort of thing like that. But basically, cow. Cavalry is no longer the shock impact troop that breaks a well-ordered group. Now, if you shot up a, um, an infantry square with a bunch of, you know, canister shot from artillery and they're all sort of like disordered and then you charge in the cavalry, yeah, fine, they're already disordered and you can break that square and, and take it out with your cavalry. But they're no longer the knights that can really sort of do that on their own. Your horse was worth, worth more than a whole village. Uh, the right horse, Yes. Not just horses, but but the right, right horse, a uh, horse that's been bred to be very heavy, and then has also been trained. Because as I don't know if you don't realize this, horses aren't entirely dumb, and horses seeing a bunch of sort of horse-like things with big, flowing, colorful things around them. You know, they put draped cloth around. You know, the the knight's livery on it, like blue and white or whatever and have big sharp pointy things at on them charging at you or a bunch of infantry a bunch of men standing there with a bunch of sharp pointy sticks at you they don't necessarily want to charge straight into that they sort of like yeah no i want to go go over here somewhere else away and and they will unless they're trained and you got to train them to do that and it takes years to train them. So yeah, depending on the village, obviously there's well-off villages, but some poor Scrabble Earth village, yeah, a proper war horse trained up can be worth more than a you know um, low-level village. And so yeah, warfare. You, this is one thing I really try to do is study the, the change and developments of warfare and see how they affect things like this, as you can tell. Okay. Well, it's getting to the point, I know we haven't got a whole lot um, of time done, just from the sort of the beginning through to mid-38, but I think we're going to end this here. Uh, I want to thank you all for watching and for your comments, Sebastian, Ragar, Harmony. Harmony, you've been great for this whole stream, giving me a lot of good tips. I'll try to remember those that are still um, coming uh, I do like World of Blaze. I just have my problems with it. Nothing is perfect. Never going to fully agree. I know that. Yeah, I'm going to, I think I'm going to be ending this here. My grandfather taught me that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, um, I'll be back tomorrow playing um, War Thunder and you're all invited to come and play with me. I'll even rotate out though. Normally just a few of us. Um, if you, it's free to play game if you don't have it. Um, Come play with me, you know, mission or two at least, or whatever, or just w hang out and watch if you don't want to play. Be doing that, and I think it's Friday for Strategic Command World at War. I'm going to be playing for Slytherine, and then some more um, Hearts of Iron and whatnot. So, yeah, thanks. Glad it was interesting. We will be doing more of this. So, um, see you tomorrow, next week, whenever or just catch the stuff on YouTube. Thanks, everyone.